Welcome to the Art of Likeability, ranked one of the top podcasts in the world. In this podcast, you'll discover how to leverage likeability to build stronger relationships, lead more efficiently, close more sales, and keep customers happy while increasing success in your professional and personal life. Let's jump in with your host, Arel Moody. What's going on, likeability family? Arel Moody here, your host of the likeability podcast where we bring together the most incredible human beings minds intellects some people who have skills that you may not even know you need like hey did you know i could solve a ruby's cube while holding my breath underwater you may think you may never need that but maybe one day you will you'll be like thank you for even putting that thought in my head because of this podcast well today we have the man the almost I, I, I'm going to go as far as to say the godfather of likability on the podcast with us today. Let me tell you a little bit about our special guest and why he is so um, influential and powerful in this particular space. And I'm so excited for it. Now, Tim Sanders was one of the early stage members of Mark Cuban's Broadcast.com company, which was the largest opening IPO in history. After Yahoo acquired that company, Tim was tapped to lead their value lab. And in 2001, he rose to the chief solutions officer. In 2005, he later founded Deeper Media, which provides consulting services for leading brands and is one of the top rated speakers on the lecture circuit. Now, Tim is the author of multiple books, including the New York Times bestseller, Love is the Killer App, How to Win Business and Influence Friends, and he is the author of The Likeability Factor. So it's a book that I have loved. It is on point. So to have him with us today, uh, incredible human, incredible soul, who gives first and truly embodies his message I am so excited to have with us Mr. Tim Sanders. How are you feeling today, Tim? Arel, I'm doing great. It's great to be with you. I'm awesome. So now you have such an incredible background. You have such a, a long history. Let people kind of know from a 10,000 foot view what you're doing now, where you're kind of spending a lot of your time, and just a little bit about your background so people can understand how you really became such an influential figure in the business space and the likability space. You know, it's a checkered past, I, I I tell people all the time I should have been an attorney. In fact, in college, I won a law school scholarship. This is back in 1980-something. <clears throat> Um, except what happened is over the summer before I was supposed to start at Baylor, I was in Tucson, Arizona, and I saw a reggae band play. And I'd never heard reggae before. I was a church kid, so I hadn't heard much of anything besides church music and rock and roll when I was growing up. Dude, I loved it so much. I didn't go to law school. I grew dreadlocks, and I toured with the band. So I took a real big diversion in my career and uh, ended up back in sales a few years later and kind of moved up through the ranks in telco. And that's where I found out about Mark Cuban and his first startup and was so lucky to get that job. But I really made the best of it. And over the course of the next few years, I really blossomed as a researcher. In college, I was a debater. um, And that's what kind of takes me to where I am today. But I'll I'll tell you, for, for your listeners, this journey for me to really understand this likability factor, what you call the art of likability, um, it started when I was a little kid. I was abandoned by my mother um, when I was four and a half. My grandmother raised me on the farm in Clovis, New Mexico. In the second grade, they put me in special education because I was just a mess, mostly a disciplinary mess. But anywho, I was in special education. They put me back in the general population, so to speak, in the sixth grade. So you can imagine, Aurel, I um, was made fun of. My nickname was Short Bus, and I had to learn to be a really likable kid, not to get beat up every single day. But I figured out some principles during that time in my life. And I really put it all together uh, when I decided to run for senior class president a few years later, and a lot of the same bullies that I feared so much were my campaign managers. And that was really the seeds for me to understand why it is so important to develop emotional appeal and to develop the ability to get other people to like you by liking them first. 
And, you know, that is an important skill set, you know, understanding. I think if you take any natural ability and I know one of the things that you put a lot of emphasis on is the importance of being very knowledgeable to build professional relationships. You have to have a very strong foundation in your knowledge base. And then when you layer on this emotional intelligence, this likability, if you will, it adds just a huge benefit to it. And when you started doing that, where did that lead? Like, what are you doing today that this path has kind of taken you to spend most of your time doing now? I'm writing my sixth book right now. I'm in the early stages of it. But the book is about how you can fall in love with people quicker, especially at work. And when I say fall in love, I mean develop an emotional effect for them. Really want them to succeed really feel the pain that they're feeling because that's how you you know behave when you love someone so i'm trying to help people understand that you can't make people earn it in your life you you got to love people not because of who they are but because of who you are and you know there's a tie in to the likability issue because what in the likability factor i talked about the foundation of the likable personality being friendliness. That's the foundation. If you're a very friendly person, then you're really on the path to being a likable person. Because think about it this way. Everybody that you ever meet wants to know if you're friend or foe, right? That's why we shake hands to prove we're not carrying a weapon. But here's the issue. And you and I really agree on this. To be likable long term in a relationship, you have to be genuine. You have to be authentic. I call it realness, right? So you can't be a friendly person if you don't like that person, right? Because friendliness is the expression of I like you, whether I do it with a smile, my tone of voice, some gesture I make. So we've got to learn to like people and like people quickly. And in my view, we've got to make that even go further. We've got to really care about them because I think love is like oxygen to people, especially in a business environment. So this ability for you to meet people Find things you like about them, things that are familiar, things that you cheer for about their story. This is a really important skill set. I think most people don't think enough about that. They just kind of wait until that magic moment happens and then they develop either like or love for the other. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and in your, your book, Love is a Killer App, you talk about the importance of kind of pairing this or, or I guess trifecta trifecting it with the idea of being knowledgeable, networking, and compassion. Now, the question that I have, which I think comes up often for a lot of folks, especially who've dived um, very deeply into our content, is when we want to create that that love for people, that, that mm-hmm. empathy for people, sometimes people almost absorb too much of other people's challenges where they almost become a a dry sponge for everyone's emotions it's like man i'm dealing with so much myself and now i'm 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 dealing with other people's things as well how do you kind of um deal with that learning how to love and be compassionate for so many people without it overtaking your life well, I mean, I, I, I think you have to love yourself enough to know when to say no, right? So I think that those that drown in affection and empathy have no sense of self-respect. And that's why, they, that's why they're so empathetic. I mean, you have to be empathetic for the right reasons. I want to take on someone's feelings so I know how they feel. But most importantly, I want to close that loop. And the way I do it, Rel, is I say to myself, their feelings are facts, And what they want me to do is acknowledge that they feel that way and not judge them. In his fantastic book, The Eighth Habit, uh, Dr. Stephen Covey Sr. talks about this idea that many times, if not 80, 90% of the time, when a person's upset, they just want to express themselves. They want to be heard. They don't want somebody to fix it. And they certainly don't want somebody to tell them they shouldn't feel that way. So it's not so much that I have to deeply absorb the other person's feeling. I have to recognize it and they need to know that I've recognized it. And then I need to just say the most important two words in the empathetic English language. And it's this, I'm sorry, and let it go. And frequently you'll find that it passes for them and it passes for you. But I'm going to say one more thing. When we're little kids, We catch feelings, right? That's why we love little kids. In fact, that's why we love pets. 
I don't know if you have a dog, but I do. And if I'm happy, he's happy. If I'm sad, he's sad. And what I've noticed both about pets and kids is their ability to absorb other people's feelings is infinite. What happens is as we grow older, we become full of our own emotions, right? We, be, we kind of develop our own story and it's got a lot of plot twists. And as we start to develop our own emotions, the wall goes up. And that wall reflects other people's emotions. That's why when a person comes to us at work and says, I'm really upset about that change in policy, the manager's already got his own problems, so he bounces off his wall. And what does he say ineffectively to that person? He says, you shouldn't feel that way. Let me give you five reasons why. So I think the issue here is that we need to, as adults, challenge ourselves to break down that wall to absorb more of other people's emotions and feelings. And I think we need to be as available emotionally to other people in our life as we are to the movies we watch and the music we listen to. Yeah, and you, you said something that was so golden, and I, and I want to repeat it because it was so powerful. And if anyone may have uh, just glossed over it, you'll, you'll miss something really powerful, that feelings are facts. Mm -hmm. that if someone is feeling something and they're upset, it's not necessarily justifying their upsetness, but understand they're upset. That feeling that they're feeling is real. Saying don't feel it or calm down or, oh, what you're feeling is wrong. Let me tell you how you should be feeling is mm -hmm. invalidating that fact, right? That's right. And you, you, when, when someone expresses to you, you know, a negative feeling, whatever it is, anger, fear, sadness. There are rare situations, perhaps in our most in intimate relationships, where we're pretty accepting of that because we have a lot of compassion for that person. But in general terms, and I think a lot about work terms, when somebody expresses a negative emotion to us, it almost is like they punched us in the chest. We just feel it. We, I, I'm, I'm moving backwards as I say it to you. That's when you study videotape, that's what people do. So then we recoil. What do we do? We come back with one or two answers. We push back, right? We say, you shouldn't feel that way. Or we say, I'll fix it. Especially men folk, we're the worst about that. Just shut up, I'll fix it. And I think it's so disappointing on the other side of that conversation, right? So in the likability factor, I talked about the idea that when you give another person validation, your feelings, your hobbies, your passions are acceptable, if not noble, that's validation. When you give that to people, it's the greatest gift psychologically you could ever give another human. That's what the research says, right? So when you could treat another people's feelings as facts, you create community. There's so many people that come to work every day and they just, they just want to think that there's somebody else in the world besides them that understands what they're going through. And I think that's the issue here. And so feelings or facts is the hallmark of the empathetic leader. Now, let, let's talk about that that concept of validation, because I tend to find in the practical implementation of validating someone, a lot of us, myself included, it's not like I, I perfect this in every conversation, we we tend to find we don't know exactly what to do. So let's let's give it an example. Let's say a coworker um, comes to you and they're really bothered by something that you directly have influenced. Let's say it was a group mm -hmm. project of some sort mm -hmm. and they felt let down by it. And they're talking mm -hmm. about how this is, I, you know, I feel like I can't trust anyone here. I feel like I'm the only one that's doing work. And it's not just a complaint, but a complaint that has a direct um, correlation to your actions. Mm -hmm. How does someone validate it, but still either want to help or want to fix without fixing being the lead? Because obviously there's a problem. Or do we not even fix it and we just validate? How do we make sure we're actually practicing this validation in a way that makes people feel it without us feeling like we don't know how or what to do in that moment? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question because when you've done something and another person takes um, offense to it for whatever reason or is disappointed by it, um, there's fact and there's fiction. But I think in the moment of relationships, it's time to always believe that their story is a nonfiction work. Okay. So step number one 
recognize what they're feeling. So when a person comes to me and says, and you get this, right? A person comes and says, I feel really, in some cases, a person, I got really irritated at you. That That's what happens with me because I'm like a Steve Jobs perfectionist. So when I'm working on a whatever project, I'm like, that pixel's wrong right there. So sometimes a person will come to me and say, man, you really, you really irritated me. I felt you were really unreasonable with me yesterday. Well, guess what? I need to improve myself. So I want to hear it all. Because I, I want to give that person the benefit of a doubt that maybe I can do a better job without showing weakness. So I say, tell me more. I love the tell me more command. This would be, it's the best question, pseudo question you could ever ask. So a person's going to unpack that for you, Arel, and I want you to listen for the truth as much as you listen for the falsehood, okay? And then you need to ask them, so tell me more about how you felt about that. You say, you know, I let you down. You say I irritated you. Help me understand what 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 happened and you felt that way. What 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 happened after that? So let them fully explain their feelings and how they acted on their feelings. And then I want you to give a pregnant pause to them. Now, because they might tell you some more in that moment of silence, just like you did, right? Because that's a very uncomfortable moment, that pregnant pause, and that's where they're going to tell you what's really going on. And I think when you've heard it all and you feel like they've expressed themselves, I want you to say, I'm sorry you feel that way and give them another pause and then ask the last question. So what should we do about it? Okay. And that's a session. That's an encounter. That's the thing we talk about. And then that person's going to tell you whatever, and you're going to take it under advisement. They're going to go away. Now here's where you become a strong leader. They come back the next day and they just won't let it go. That is when you need to push back and say, okay, here's the reason I did this and I think I did it the right way. I'm sorry you felt the way you did, but I had to do this considering everybody else in the group. But that's not my initial response. That's my secondary response because there are whiners in the world. So there are exceptions to this validation principle and that's how you do it. Got it. Now, do you have any tips or tricks or, or any even personal observations when so when we're in a very logical uh, mind frame, like if someone is addressing something that maybe not that's not an emotional trigger for us. Like, hey, you irritated me when you said that. If I'm someone who can logically go, oh, there was an irritation, I can logically separate it. But maybe it's like, you know, Tim, you're just, you only care about yourself. You're the guy who says like a Billy, whatever is the thing that like hits your trigger that puts you into a emotional state, your pulse gets higher. How do we, because that's when we need to help the most, right? Not when we're in our logical state, when we're in our emotional state. Is there anything that you've found works really well to either pull you out of that emotional state or, or do you go further? or into it, but have a way of coping with it so that maybe your face isn't showing angst or twisting or letting those unconscious cues take over so you can be present and empathetic for the person, even if they're hitting your emotional triggers that like take you to the like insane asylum. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that, you know, getting back to this idea, I think we have to listen with power in as much as that I'm always willing to learn how I can improve. I may not say to you, Aurel, oh, I need to get better at that because sometimes in that conversation, you know, it could lead you to pile on, right? But I think we need to be open to this. I'll give you a little story to illustrate how I think about criticism because that's what we're really talking about. How do you deal with the person who comes at you presumably to share their feelings and they end up just criticizing you. And sometimes the criticism's incredibly general, like you're a selfish person, as opposed to in the meeting, you did this wrong thing. How do you deal with that? Well, I want you to have a, a perspective about it. Okay. So when I was a little kid and I mentioned to you, special ed, it was, it was a really tough, weird part of my life. But, um, in the fourth grade, um, I went to church camp and church camp's the one place where I'm not short bus. You know, it's a really great thing to go to church camp. And I, I when I was a kid, I, I sang, I played piano. I, I loved to do that in church. So at church camp, I, I volunteered to be one of the, the kids that that sang a song before like the big, you know, worship ceremony. And so I went out and the first time I really did this in front of a lot of kids it was a couple hundred kids. And <laughs> I'm kind of a ham. So I was just supposed to sing this song. But like Steve Allen, I did like a five minute little mini sermon before I did the song because I'm, I'm, I'm a hog. Listen to me. And so anyway, um, all the all the kids from other schools there come up to me. Like, oh, it was really great. We loved it. And I was feeling so good. And then I got on the school bus and all the kids from my church picked on me. They told me that I sounded like a squeaker. Even 
Gil Johnson got on me as like, Tim, you shouldn't talk. You should sing. That was really rude because they didn't. You know, da, da. And so when I got home, Billy, my grandmother asked, well, how was church camp? And I said, I'm never going to sing in public again. It was horrible. The kids, the kids were all picking on me. They said I uh, sounded bad. Even, even Mr. Johnson, you know, said that I shouldn't have said anything. So Billy goes to the pantry and she comes out with a walnut and she cracks it open and she hands it to me. And then I take the nut, of course, like a kid and I put it in my mouth and I eat it. And then she holds the shells out and says, you're going to eat these. And I said, no, I'm not going to eat those. She says, I want you to think about everything you heard on that bus, like this walnut. Your job is to find the nut and to dump the shells. Those kids were jealous of all the attention you got. You're very different because you're in a different school and it some, makes some of them afraid. And Gil Johnson was 100% right. You should have just sung your song. That's the nut in all of this. So, dude, for the rest of my life, that's how I deal with criticism. Whether it's a one-star review on Amazon or something negative in a project, I'm always looking for the nut, but I always dump the shells because criticism is a gift. It tells you sometimes something about yourself you can improve with, but every single time criticism tells you something you need to know about the person that gives it to you because it's going to change the way you think about that person in a constructive way, and it's also going to help you improve in a constructive way. So that's how I deal with that. And if that doesn't work, I negotiate with them, letting them know by, by using such general terms like you're selfish you're just about to make this an emotional conversation when we need to keep it practical. So sometimes, you know, when all else fails, negotiate with the other person to have a logical outcome. Yeah, the the walnut analogy is almost perfect. It could just be perfect as a way of seeing it because with every criticism, there is something that you've done or something that has rubbed someone the wrong way. Whether you agree with it or not, we right. have to be responsible for the consequences we created people. So right. it's a perfect analogy because there is always maybe something that could be beneficial in it. So I love that. Yep. And let's let's tie that back to likability too, because in the book, I talk about the idea that highly likable people get better annual reviews at work. That's what the research says. And what I find so interesting about that is that you're not getting a better review because the boss likes you. Because anybody listening that works at a big company knows there's something called force distribution. You can only give out so many exceeds expectations or outstanding performers. So it can't be a popularity contest with the curve, right? The reason that likable people get better reviews is because their boss is so comfortable being candid and giving them constructive criticism. They absorb it so well. They get it all the time and they're getting more coaching than the person sitting next to them. And so they're given every little insight they need to exceed expectations or become that outstanding performer. So the better you are at absorbing criticism and dealing with it correctly, the more likely you are to be successful at work. That's the essence of likability. Yeah, and I find that the uh, the big challenge that happens when someone starts feeling they're being criticized or they start feeling like someone's saying you didn't do such a great job is they immediately go into a defensive, well, let me explain why I did that. Let me justify why. But they're not listening. They're not hearing. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a big component of what you talk about and what you teach is that idea of that power of listening, that power of taking it in. Is that right? Absolutely. Highly likable people have a, a sense of presence. They're in the moment, this moment. And when we're defensive, we're not in this moment. We're in the past or we're in the future. We're in the past trying to say, but, but look at all these things I've done, or we're thinking into the future saying, I need to extinguish this right now. So, so if you're fully present with someone, you'll do so much better with criticism because you're going you're gonna to taste that criticism for a second. And, and you're going to try to understand that a little bit more. So, you know, to kind of bring this full circle, when I think of what likability is, I think of it as a person's capacity to consistently produce positive emotional experiences in others that they spend time with. That's what that is. And, and, and it is tested, Arel. It is tested with criticism. It's tested when you face hostility. 
It's tested when you have to deliver not so good news. It's tested when you have to coach someone, when you have to give them constructive criticism. But if you can figure out how to get through those trying moments and still produce a positive emotional experience, if it's nothing else other than I thought he was a true grown up and was honest with me, then you have figured this out. That's it. And that is that is the key, because if you can look for almost consciously searching, you know, when you start feeling that anxiety rise, that emotional turmoil rise, when the criticism starts hitting, if you start saying, OK, where's the walnut? Where's the walnut? Where's the walnut? Mm-hmm. And then even if it's like you said, I, I hit it everything they said, but at least they were an adult and they came to me. So look at that. That's right. That, that That's puts right. you in the power and not in the victim role. Right. That's right. That's right. Because we worry so much what people are going to think about us. We discount too much how they're going to feel about us. And that's what I care about. That was a a really profound thing I heard. It was years ago. I was still at Yahoo and David Stern, the former NBA commish. That's one of the things he said about, you know, his life and why he liked Cuban so much and why he agreed to to be part of our event is he said, you know, it's not important what people think of you because you can't control it. People are crazy. He says, but it's entirely crucial how they feel about you. That's your reputation. That's your social esteem. And you you should be concerned about that. Right. And when you see people and you've you've worked with some of the biggest businesses in the world, you're, you know, a a public consultant, as Time magazine referred to you, you you deal with um, incredible people at the highest level. Has there been anything that you've noticed? When you look at leaders or you look at people who are looking to excel, that they just as a as a unifying thread, they keep doing this wrong. They just keep, you know, this is why people are bringing you in to fix these challenges within organizations. Is there anything that you've seen that is almost ubiquitous in the industries you go into that need to get course corrected the most? Um, I, I think that what, what I worry about today is that we as leaders are not being genuine with the people that we lead when we're not present 100%. Um, when we were doing research for the book, and even since then I've done more of this, we would study this issue of, of perceived authenticity. You know, is my leader real? Is, is she singing the same song on the inside as she is on the outside, you know, as Judy Garland would say about it. And so when we tested people, we said, well, do do you think that he is a real person? Like he's authentic. And when they said no, we really dialed into like, why? Why is that person not authentic? Well, guess what the number one answer was? Lied to me in the past or lied to us in the past. That's the number one answer. But the number two answer, distracted, easily distracted, never pays attention, furtive. And we live in a smartphone world, dude. It's like you can't have a real meeting with someone. Jerry Seinfeld said he hated meetings with Hollywood because everybody would set their cell phones in the middle of the table. And if it rang, they'd stop and answer it. He said he felt like running in the hall and calling them on their cell phone so he could have two minutes of their undivided attention. That's the world we live in today. So leaders, leave your cell phone in your office. If you say you're going to have a meeting with someone, then sit with them and have a meeting with them. Like you and I are having a conversation. There's not a thing turned on in my office other than this podcast. I got my phone turned off, got my computer thing silenced, don't even have my glasses on. I'm just with you. That's what leaders need to do a better job of. And I've met a lot of people in my life that I would say on a scale of one to 10 or a likability factor nine, high L factor people, people like Bill Clinton or Bono or Oprah Winfrey or, or, or Ellen DeGeneres. And when I talk to people that have met them and feel the same way and realize that that's a really likable person, that's the thing they always come back to, whether it's Oprah, Clinton, whatever. They say, you know what? When you're with her, it's like you're the only person in the world. I had I had a person who was part of the royal family in England talking about Bill Clinton saying, man, when he was engaged with one of our servers – You could see he was locked onto the server. The Queen of England couldn't have got him unlocked from talking to that person. That sense of presence is the ultimate in being a likable leader. But now what do we do? We're managing three or four things at once in every interaction with other people, and we wonder why they don't trust us. Mm. And I I, I swear, if this is the only thing, and you've been dropping nuggets after nuggets, uh, we'll say walnuts after walnuts, 
Um, but the distraction is huge now, whether it's talking to someone and when you're looking at their eyes, you're asking yourself, are they thinking mm -hmm. about something else? Am I keeping them? Am I bothering mm -hmm. them? Am I um, not good at like, even if those thoughts start seeping into my mind, it affects the way I feel about you. And you may have just checked your clock because your wrist itched or whatever, but you have to make a conscious effort to be locked in. You're, you're absolutely right about that. And I'm curious um, because this is something that, um, yeah, it's a very personal thing. So I'll, I'll just share my personal vulnerability here with it. I noticed that when I'm at events, um, and I know networking is is a very big thing that you believe in and building mm -hmm. contacts, right? Mm -hmm. And building connections. What happens when you're in a room and you're locked in on someone and you're having a great conversation, but then that person starts like, wow, this person's giving me a lot of attention. I like this. And then they start monopolizing your time and you're like, well, I do want to interact with others or I need to, you know, maybe you feel like you just gave a keynote, for example, Tim. And, you know, as I'm sure happens every time you give a keynote, thousands of people or hundreds of people come around and they want to connect with you because you spoke. But there's that person who feels so locked in and you're so undistracted that they don't get the cue socially that, you know, it's time for you to create that experience for others. How do you maintain your likability and maintain your connection without making the person feeling like you're shrugging them off because their time is due. It's really tough. I mean, that's one of the greatest challenges you face uh, being a public person, you know, no matter who you are. If you're at a conference, you become a public person when you make a presentation, right? You become a public person when you win an award. You become a public person when maybe you've got a set of accomplishments that are greater than those you're going to meet in the room, right? So an aspiring entrepreneur meets somebody with 100 dry cleaners, they're going to monopolize that guy to figure out how can I have 100 dry cleaners. This is a huge challenge. Um, there's no easy answer. Um, just remember one thing. You don't have to meet everybody in the room. That's a very, very important paradigm. So you don't have a quota who you need to meet, and it's going to make you a little easier to lock on to somebody without a time clock going on in your head. Um, there, there's a there's a repetition that happens sometimes in those conversations when you've, you've heard their story and they're going to tell it to you again a few more times, and that's a point where you know the conversation's ending, or there's the I want part of the conversation. So they meet you, and they're they're very congratulatory, and then they tell you a bunch about themselves, and then they start with the I want. So there's all those things that happen, and you really just want to say, look, I don't want to be rude, but I've got other people I've got to see. It tends to offend them, and I've tried hard over the years to figure out some really nice way to say it. But but I've learned that sometimes when you're locked on to a person, another person walks up and wants to talk to you. That's the issue, Right. I found a way without breaking eye contact with the person I'm talking to, to wave the other person over to us and to join our conversation. And the minute my original partner takes a breath, I ask our new person, tell us who you are. And then I introduce that conversational partner to my other person. And then I immediately shift the conversation to our new person, which means now that the original partner would have to be rude to two people. And I've learned open the circle, open the circle, and you can end up having a circle of 12 people. And you've really worked the party without hurting anybody's feelings. So that's the best answer I can give you, but it's a big challenge. Yeah. Do you ever, um, so I know like one of your, your strategies, which I love, um, is the idea of you build context, build connections, and then disappear. Do you ever do the... Um, oh my gosh, let me, you know, wave the person over and then you connect those two people and then just kind of slide oh, yeah. into the background. Well, yeah, you, you connect them and then sometimes they go off into their own conversation and then you say, just to be polite, I'm going to go over here. At that point, they're talking, no one's going to be offended. So I think that's the trick. You know, when I, when I think about disappearing, what I mean is that when I, when I make a networking introduction, I introduce two people that I want them to meet, I want them to go do something, I never follow up to see if something good happened or if I, you know, you know what I mean? So that's what I mean because you know, love means never having to say you owe me. Um, so when I connect people, I love to kind of disappear and let them do their own thing because it's really not a big deal to connect people. Now, let me ask you this. Um, you build lots of connections. You build a lot of relationships with people, you learn how to, you know, as you said, you can be in an event, open up the circle. So there are um, 12 people in there. Have you had an experience where you've been at an event, uh, you've met a lot of people and then, you know, you do a great job. You get invited back. I know you're a very in-demand um, keynote speaker. You get invited back, you know, multiple times at an event. Someone comes up to you 
And, you know, they've been watching you on social media. They've been following you since you spoke. So they feel like they know you intimately, but you just genuinely don't remember the person because you meet so many people. How do you deal with that person who's like, oh, Tim, it's so good to see you, blah, 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 and you just can't remember who they are. Do you do you roll with it? Do you acknowledge the, I'm sorry, I don't remember you, I feel bad? I'm curious how one deals with that and still maintains their, their love and connection for someone. I roll with it. I mean, I roll with it, and usually they, during the context of the conversation, they refresh that for me. But I'll tell you something else. A long time ago, I learned it was really important to try to remember people's names and to associate names with faces and to scale that ability. I mean, if a person can speed read, why can't they have you know better memory of names? And and I don't have it in front of me, but Dale Carnegie wrote a neat little pamphlet. I'll I'll make a copy and send it to you. But he wrote this little pamphlet on how to remember people's names. And it had to do with the shortcut association I make. Okay, so it's like, um, so 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 Arel, if I if I saw you, you know, obviously I, I, I'm looking at your picture right now on, on our on our Skype cast, you know, um, and, and I would say Arel is not Pharrell. And, and, and that would be a shortcut, for example. Um, so, cause I got a buddy that's named Pharrell and it's like, I associate with that, but you look different than him. So you're not Pharrell. So it's like, I think about that. Um, it's a simple little thing. Sometimes I'll see a guy, um, and his, his name is Gordon. And, and then I think of, you know, Gordo, Gordo, the wild guy, or I'll say some kind of heuristic in my mind because he's got big hair and he's got a big personality. He's got a shock of hair. So he's Gordo, the wild guy. It's such a simple little thing. You sell yourself. I can see that guy five years from now. I want to be that's Gordo, the wild guy, but I'll only say Gordo. So I've worked on that a lot. And, and, and the good news is, is that I've been able to recognize a lot of people I haven't seen for a long time. And, and, you know, sometimes you don't, and you can tell they want you to recognize them by name. They don't have a badge. So I'll say, yep, this is Tim. And once again, you are, and I go, got it. Thanks. And if they look offended, I go, sorry, I've slept since then. And it's kind of a, a very transparent thing. And then they usually say, oh, I, I, you know, I bet you meet just a ton of people. So, so when you're in that situation, sometimes it's just as simple as to say, and once again, you are, and when they say their name, repeat it. That's a really important part of not only accepting a person, but remembering their name. I always say that when someone says it, immediately repeat it back to them and smile at them. You know, and, and I'm actually curious now to ask you this. It's just more of just a, a, a personal curiosity. Um, you know, remembering people's names, I, I agree with you, is is one of the... Literally, if you haven't seen someone in like six months and you go, Hey, Tim, how are you? It's, you know, I, I think Dale Carnegie said it's the sweetest word in the English mm-hmm. language, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Have you ever dealt with a situation where there's someone that you've just seen constantly, like constantly, but for whatever reason their name just doesn't stick. Like it just, you know, their face, you know, intimate details. Mm. You just mm-hmm. don't know their name. Is there Dude, I'm any- not going to admit it. I'm not going to admit <laughs> it. That, that is when, because that's on me. And, and, that, yeah. and, and that, that is, that is uh, what I call low EVP, low emotional value proposition to do that. Somebody you've talked to a hundred times met either you've got, you know, the, you're having a senior moment or you're forgetful or for whatever reason, man, you just decided not to store that in your, your hard drive. It's in your RAM, right? Because that's what we do. That's why people are so offended when we, we don't, re, you know, they don't remember our names, right? So be, because it was in RAM. It wasn't in hard drive. I deserve to be on hard drive memory. So so I'm going to roll with it. I'm going to be like, dude, man, excellent. Wow. And I'm gonna just going to hang with it. And sometimes <laughs> yeah. it'll come to me in the middle of the conversation or something will come along that'll save me. Like another guy will be like, yo. Arel, and I'd be like Arel, Arel the Bell. I'm never going to forget that. Uh, but uh, no, I'm not going to say it, and, and it's because I don't want to make the other person feel bad. I'm going to figure it out if I can, but I'm not going to say that because that that's a uh, it's, it's a negative, right? And you mentioned before a million to knowledge, so I call the intellectual. A value proposition. We also usually have a financial value proposition. We have a physical value proposition certain certain times. But you've got to have an emotional value proposition to other people. So you've always got to think about those negative moments that take out part of your value proposition. And you just have to, you know, kind of feel bad for not remembering their name and do a better job in the future. But roll with it. Yeah, no, it's it's so important. And a lot of times I think a lot of people will um, they'll forgive you for, you know, uh, momentary lapses. And I've actually found from a more um, uh, um, 
strategic perspective, if you will. I don't even know if that's the right word, but having something you can say like, you, oh, it's like you said, um, it's been, a, I haven't slept since then or, or some type of phrase that almost creates a laugh or a, a connection point is something good to have because it, it works and it shouldn't be something that you use as a crutch. Like it shouldn't be like, Oh, I got this pocket phrase I can use. I don't have to remember anyone's name, but it's good to have. Oh, yeah. You know, that, that's certainly not my recommendation there. I've known people like that. They, they don't really connect with anybody. They just have all these, everybody's dude. <laughs> right. Everybody's dude. What's up? You know? And, um, I yeah. love, I love the, um, I love just that, that authenticity of, of rolling with it, acknowledging what your, your side of it is. So when, when it comes to, you know, kind of maybe taking a couple of steps back into that authenticity and the lack of being distracted and that really builds it. Let's say I'm someone, I'm working in a, um, a business, large, medium sized business, whatever it might be. I have multiple people I'm working with and I'm like, all right, I'm listening to Tim. I'm loving what Tim's saying. I want to start, um, being more likable and using Tim Sanders as my likability Sherpa. Um, what would you recommend like as a starting point? Like, all right, you want to jump in. Maybe someone is listening to this interview for the first time. They're introduced to our podcast. Maybe they've listened to all of our episodes. Are there any great starting points that you recommend people take immediately to start getting some wins under their belt so they can build their like ability factor so they can feel like, yeah, these are quick wins. These are getting me, um, I'm feeling that people are having a better emotional experience around me. What are the things we can do to build that momentum as we, you know, have love and as we build our like ability as well? Um, create opportunities for people to share their stories or their passions and don't interrupt them with saying, wow, I went through the same thing. Believe it or not, you would think that's being empathetic. Um, but if, if they haven't fully unpacked their story or passion, it's highly interruptive. And researchers say that makes them kind of feel bad. I mean, they're talking about their things. So be open to other people to explain their passions. But once they explain their passions or share their story and you feel like they've properly been heard, then build connection points. Especially if their story has to do with a struggle or a negative feeling where you can say, I can, I can feel your struggle. You know, 10 years ago, I went through a very similar thing and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I can only imagine, you know, how you must feel right now. Timing is everything. A, a, a great a great joke is, you know, wh wh what's the secret to being funny? Timing, right? So, so, so master your timing. So as Stephen Covey Sr. would say, seek first to understand, um, then to be understood. Here's a here's a quick win. So if you're a manager and you feel like, you know, the group needs to have better relationships or you need to have better relationships with the group, and we'll we'll say where you can get this later, there's a little exercise you can do. I call it the five by five. I wrote about this. Um, the five by five exercise says write down five things that you have a passion for, hobby, and 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 personal obligations don't count. So don't think of work or family. Think of things that are your own passions. And then write down five people that you see all the time at work and underneath their name, write down two things that they have as a passion or a hobby. And I've done this with really big groups. And sometimes you have to give everybody a lifeline so they can call that person and say, I, I apologize. I, I don't know what, what's your hobby because we're not very good at that. But anyway, if you get your five passions and then five frequent contacts and their two passions, did you know that you have a 70% chance of making an authentic connection between one of your passions and one of the passions of one of the five people you see every day. And in our research, over half the time, you've never shared it and you've never done it together. So it could be a loose tie, as Malcolm Gladwell calls it. So maybe you like to be outdoors to see nature and your buddy likes to hunt. Okay? They're close. But the point is, we found when you even just have a discussion about that connection, that common ground, it creates a bond between you and the other person. It's called connecting at a passion to passion level. Let me give you one more piece of advice as a manager leader. I want you to go out of your way to find the benefit in someone's idea, even if you're going to reject it. I want you to spend the time to find the beauty in someone's beat, whether it's their personality or the way they approach things. I want you to spend just as much time trying to catch people doing something right as you do trying to find fault in them. And I'll share just a little story to illustrate this that's not in the book that I think you'll really appreciate. So 
In 2005, after the University of Texas Longhorns won the NCAA football championship, there were a series of interviews, uh, one by the Washington Post uh, that, I, that comes to mind, uh, with different players on the team. And what, it, what, what they kind of found out is that what made that team such a great team is there was such buy-in uh, to Coach Mac Brown's strategy to basically give Vince Young, the quarterback, the ball every single play, right? It was a quarterback run offense that required a whole lot of buy-in. Because for a lot of these kids, especially the guys in the backfield or the receivers, I mean, that was an audition, if you will, for NFL. There was such a great conversation, though, um, with Cedric Benson. And Cedric Benson, you know, basically said that Mac Brown uh, accepted us more than our own parents did. And then I saw the headline to one of the stories on, on, on uh, it was covering it. It was like secret to Longhorns championship, Coach Brown buys an iPod. And so when I dug into the story, I find out that before that championship season, Coach Mac Brown's daughter bought him an iPod. And being a 57-year-old man from Tennessee, he loaded both kinds of music on his iPod, country and Western. And then one day during the non-contact drills before the season, he noticed that his quarterback, Vince Young, had the exact same make and model of iPod as Coach Brown would say. So he says, and this is crazy, Arell, he says, swap iPods with me to Vince right before a practice. So he plugs into Vince's iPod and for the first time ever is exposed to hip hop music. He'd really never heard it before. So for the next two and a half hours, he heard a lot of new artists from Tribe Called Quest to Ice Cube that he'd never heard before. And then a couple of modern ones you can imagine. Anyway, he's going to hand the iPod back to Vince and say to him, I can't believe you listen to this stuff. But Max says he caught himself because he heard his father's booming voice when he was 12 years old at the kitchen table saying, why do you listen to Hank Williams? He's a criminal. Why do you listen to Johnny Cash? He's a bad man. And, 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 and Brown said, I'd never really trusted my dad's opinion about music after that. So instead, he says to Vince, this music is different. I've never heard it before. Is this, is this all the kids listen to? And Vince says, well, yeah, a lot of us. Some of them listen to you know, rock and roll. And he says, can you give me a list of all these songs, songs you think all the kids listen to? So anyway, he takes that list. He goes to his daughter. He says, delete everything on my iPod and put this list on. And for the rest of the year, he just studied their music to find out why it was beautiful. As he would say, why hip hop was like CNN why this hard rock music was the disaffected youth finding a place and finding meaning. He found the beauty in the beat. And Cedric Benson, the running back, told those reporters, trust is a two-way street. He was one of the first people in our life that accepted our choice of music without judgment. So leaders, learn to find that in the people you work with, especially those who are trying to adjust to a new generation, the millennials, it's really important for you to really put an effort in to understand what makes them so special, what they're passionate about, and what makes that great. And I, I tend to find you, you know, it's such a such a great story because when we take the time to get into someone's world, if we immediately criticize or we immediately downplay, it's almost like we're invalidating Mm -hmm. the whole person, like you make bad choices versus just a musical choice. So spending the time, again, to look for the walnut, that CNN, if you will, of it, it's such a great, it's a great piece of, of content. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious now, do you have any other, you know, that, that taking the time to understand more, do you have any other great strategies for, for people who are in mentor roles that if they want to become more effective, they take this time to mm -hmm. learn more. Any other quick mm -hmm. strategies like that? Because that was so just spot on. So a few things. Uh, one is what I call prescriptive reading. So if you really want to produce a positive emotional experience on the other side of the table, when you have a conversation with someone, maybe a client or somebody that has a different industry approach than you, and they talk about their problems, go read a book about their problem read it like a student. If it's a great book, the next time you meet them, talk about this book, give them a, the copy of the book in your notes as a gift. The fact that you went the extra effort to understand their problem enough to study it is a game changer. Okay. So that's a big thing I recommend a lot um, that you can, and by the way, um, you'll learn something new. It'll be something right outside of your core learning zone and it'll expand your resume. Here's the second thing. If you do mentor someone, um, in every interaction, it's really important that you have a specific curriculum. So if I'm mentoring you, what that means is I think you're a hero and I'm going to give you a gift of knowledge so that you, Luke Skywalker, 
can make it to the next stage of your journey. That's what a mentor is. But the key here is that you're, you're, you're not smarter than someone when you mentor them. You merely know something they need to know in this present moment, okay? But if you mentor people, you should be mentoring heroes, not opportunists. So always remember, at the end of every mentorship conversation, leave the last 10 minutes to let them mentor you back. Empower the student to be the teacher. Because one of the greatest things you get out of mentorship is renewed insights, and you also create confidence on the other side of the table because the person doesn't just know more. They're so respected because you gave them a chance to talk to you. And I kind of learned this in mentorship experiences with Stanley Marcus Jr. back in the 90s in Dallas when he was mentoring me because he'd always leave that gap and ask me some questions about e-commerce or whatever. And that's why he told me kind of later, the reason I do that is because I know you want to give back because you're grateful for me mentoring you. I know that you got something to tell me because I only pick heroes and you're going somewhere for a reason. And he says, if I open myself up to empower the student, he says, I will never get dumber in the effort of making other people smarter. So that's a little trick I think that's important to mentorship, empower that, that student. Absolutely. I love that. And, you know, I have, an, I have another question for you as we, we kind of move toward the uh, the end part of our interview here but at this point i am absolutely confident that if you're listening to this you want to know more about what you're doing they want to know more about your your books the new book the deal storming book that's coming up what's the best place for people to get more of what tim sanders is doing right now and get a lot of this great content um, we've actually created a page just for your art of likability listeners. It's timsanders.com front slash likability. I'll say it again, timsanders.com front slash likability. The assessment will be there. That's the likability assessment from the book. It's 20 questions you can ask yourself and give yourself a score. The five by five exercise I mentioned earlier will be there. And there'll also be different ways for you to connect with me like LinkedIn or Twitter. So timsanders.com front slash likability. And we will have a, a link to that in our show notes because the, you know, getting the assessment in there's the, the free chapter of uh, the deal storm and that's going to be there, the exercise. It's, it's, I mean, it's great stuff that's going to be there. So I appreciate you doing that. Um, and I, I've got a question for you that I know is on our our listeners' minds. And you, you alluded to it earlier and I want to come back to it because, you know, you mentioned there is no quota when you're going to meet people and you're giving us these incredible things, the five by five strategy. You're giving us how to, you know, look at a, a book of someone and come back, listen to their music. The thing that I think will come up in a lot of people's mind is they go, Tim, that sounds great, but how do I choose which people to do these things for? I meet so many people. I have so many stakeholders, so many family people, people who are part of my church, synagogue, mosque, uh, my nonprofit work. I'm on boards. I have relationships, children. I've got coworkers. I've got places I want to get to in my business. And it's easy to get overwhelmed with all of the different places we can apply these great strategies that do take love, caring, and time. Do you have any advice for how we can choose, deal with, or look at that particular angle? My, my philosophy uh, is that I choose people that I can help the most. I don't choose people that can help me the most because I'm wrong every time I try that. And that's such a selfish way to think about networking, right? So when I'm in a room, I'm looking and you can see it on someone's face, Aurel. You can see it. They have a need. They want to see you for something. And I, I try to gravitate to the people that, that are choosing me. And I find that some of the greatest stories, some of the greatest impacts I've ever been able to make on a person was simply by being open to that idea that I'm going to choose the person I can help the most. And it's a very different philosophy than who's in the room that's going to get me the client or get me the promotion or get me the, you know, whatever it is. It's it's a very different perspective, that kind of, and we can almost feel when someone's just kind of hunting for personal gain. So that Yeah. And those aren't networkers, folks. Those are prospectors. It's just short <laughs> telemarketer at a networking event, okay? Networking is when you connect two people that should meet and create value. Networking is not a shortcut for your career. You may do things that are prospecting oriented, but remember, it's prospecting, not networking. 
Absolutely. You know, and is there anything else that um, you would love to get asked more, but maybe it doesn't come up or it's it's a topic that's a little off brand so it doesn't get brought up, but you are particularly passionate about it. Is there anything that you wish you would get asked more that you think really moves the needle in our everyday life? Um, yeah, I, I think that I, I wish more people would ask, you know, how you can leverage likability in a marriage or a family relationship at work. Because a lot of times we have that very separate, right? So when I talk to leaders that have come down with this distractionitis, um, I always tell them that one of the secrets to success in my marriage um, has been that, and by the way, not just in my marriage, but in my networking, um, is that I don't carry a phone. I do not carry a phone when my wife and I are out. She's got one. If it's an emergency, she can call somebody. Sometimes um, I'll carry a camera. It's much more social. <laughs> when I go to a networking reception, I never carry a phone. I only carry a camera. And so I tell leaders that. And they say, well, why in the world would you do that? I mean, you can't check your sports scores. You can't do your email. I go precisely. And then they get it. You know, when I go on a date, I go on a date. When I go to a networking event, I go talk to people. The absence of having a phone with you will change your life as a leader. And sometimes by just sharing how it works in my marriage or my social life, they kind of get it. Oh, that's why I need to have a new habit that when I go to meetings with clients, I never have a phone on me. So that's an example of what I call crossover learning, um, because I think there is very little difference between our personal life and our professional life. And we can learn one thing in one area and it's certainly take it to the other, especially the things we learn in our personal intimate relationships. Tim, I think you just saved a bunch of marriages and you don't even realize it with that <laughs> tip right there, my friend. And you may have sparked some new ones that may have gotten uh, killed at the source because of a, a silly phone distraction. And I, I couldn't agree I, with you more. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, man. Well, listen, again, guys, you have to, guys and gals, please go to timsanders.com slash likability. You get such an incredible group of resources from the five by five exercise that we mentioned, the likability assessment. You can download some content, go around his, his website. It's got tons of great resources. Um, Tim, clearly, likable guy so well done you know you've you've truly graced us with some incredible information and i'll tell you whether you're learning more about other people whether you're figuring out how to be less distracted when you're connecting with people whether you're taking the time to figure out what your passions are and connecting them with other people's passions whether you're seeing to yourself how do i become more knowledgeable to connect people that i can help the most versus seeking how i can be helped if any of these things sound good i want to be very clear and i say this at every episode that information will not help your life in any way. The implementation of this information will absolutely transform your life. Thank you so much, Tim, for being absolutely. here. Thank you for just sharing such great information, dude. It was awesome. Wonderful. I had a great time. Thank you. All right. Say everybody later. You are awesome. Thanks for listening. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast, The Art of Likeability, and reach out with any questions you have. Until next time, remember, my friend, you are awesome.